Hi there, everyone. My name is Priyak Jathani. I'm an MDMA student here at Yale University. And today I want to talk about the U.S. News and World Report rankings and how they're calculated. And the reason I want to do this is because I know it's always an issue that's at top of mind for a lot of people. In fact, when I applied to medical school, I know that this is where I got all of my information in terms of like what schools are amazing, what schools are like cream of the crop sort of thing. And uh, it's just important to understand that while these rankings are definitely important and shape a lot of people's behaviors, there are obviously different ways they're calculated and understanding these ways should inform the the sort of interpretation you have of these rankings, right? So that's my goal today. I'm not trying to tell you that these rankings suck. I'm also not trying to tell you that they're the end-all be-all and that if you don't get into one of these schools, you're a horrible person. Uh, I just want to show you how they're calculated because um, one, it's informative, two, it's educational, and three, I think it will help you be a bit more uh, critical of the data you see. And uh, after all, all of those things are the goal of this channel. So here are the rankings. I'm sure you have seen them. This is 2022. Harvard is obviously Harvard. You had then you have NYU, uh, exceptional school, Duke, Columbia, Stanford, which were the top five. Uh, U.S. News and World Report. This is for the research aspect. Today, I'm just going to go over the methodology behind the research rankings. So if you if you go to U.S. News and World Report for medical schools, you'll see that there are a top research. Uh, institutions and then there's top uh, schools in terms of primary care. Both of them are conducted and calculated in very different ways. Today we're just going to go over the research sector primarily because I know a lot of people rely on that one but I also know that people also rely on primary care and I'm going to go over that in a separate video for the sake of brevity and clarity. So now let's actually go straight to the source in terms of behind the numbers. So I'm going to link the way the whole thing is calculated and where I got the source of this video in the description below, as I always do, primarily for the sake of transparency. But just remember that the U.S. News & World Report surveyed about 191 medical schools accredited in 2020, and about 129 schools responded, and each of them provided enough data to calculate a rank, but 123 of these schools were ranked in both the research and primary care rankings. Today, again, we're only going to talk about the research rankings. So now we go into it. I want you to know that the whole ranking is 100%. And there's obviously a lot of factors that contribute to 100%. And so let's just go over each of these things. And then at the end, I'll do a brief summary. So 30% of the ranking for the research medical schools, which is you know shown here, is calculated by quality assessment. What does this mean? Well, of that 30%, 15% or one half of that 30% is peer assessment. So that means medical school and osteopathic school deans, deans of academic affairs, heads of internal medicine, uh, directors of admission are all polled about different schools and they're asked, hey, what do you think about this school? What do you think about this school? Uh, and they're asked on a scale of one to five, what is the quality of their research? If they give a five, that's obviously the highest rating. If they give a bit lower than five, that's a bit lower. And the whole aspect is to then weight all of their opinions and obviously a school that like let's say everyone thinks that this school has five out of five research then that school is going to get the full 15 percent right but if a school doesn't have full five out of five and they have a, maybe a three they wouldn't get the full 15 percent they'd get a bit lower the other 15 percent of this 30 percent is from residency program directors these are pro a residency program director is the person in charge of a residency program at a school. So if you're applying for urology, there's a program director for urology. If you're applying for internal medicine at Yale, there's a program director for internal medicine at Yale. All of them are surveyed and they're asked, hey, what do you think about the quality of research at Institution X? And again, they rate out of five. And if all of them rated five out of five, you'd get the full 15% here. And if they rated a bit lower than that, you wouldn't get the full 15%. And obviously this is all normalized to make sure that you're, you know, comparing schools against each other. So that's the quality assessment piece. That's 30% of the overall score behind the rankings. And now the next one is the 20%. When I was a undergraduate student applying, I used to think the rankings were pretty much determined by these things. But actually, this is only 20% of the rankings, right? Uh, so just remember that. But 20% of the rankings is actually based on MCAT, GPA, and uh, the selectivity of the medical school. And that is a val very valid contributor, right? You might think of like these prestigious institutions like Harvard as being really intense and having the best MCAT scores and the highest um, uh, selectivity as well as the highest GPAs. And while they probably do, uh, that notice that that's only about one-fifth of the things that go into the ranking. So of that 20%, 13% is the median MCAT, 6% is the median GPA, and 1% is the acceptance rate. So just to kind of show you off the bat how different this is from what you may think. Because when people apply to medical school, they often think that their GPA and MCAT are generally, you know, should be weighted about equally. In the rankings, they're not. And so you may know, like, if you didn't do well on your GPA, 
you can make up for that with a better MCAT. If you didn't do well on the MCAT, you can make up for that with your GPA. But just notice how in the rankings, it's not weighted that way. The MCAT, the median MCAT is weighted a bit higher than the GPA. And this is also the same. So like if your median MCAT is like a 528, you're going to get the full 13% because that's a really high median MCAT score. If your median MCAT is a bit lower than 528, you won't get the full 13%. You'll get a bit lower lower than that, and that's added to your score as well. Same with the GPA. Obviously, a median GPA of 4.0 would be the full 6%, and et cetera. So that is the next 20%. We still have 50% left. The next 10% is the faculty resources, and essentially what this measures is the ratio of full-time faculty to number of students. So the higher that ratio, the more of this 10% you'd get. If you have like 300 faculty for one student, that's a great ratio. You're probably going to get you know very close to the full 10% of this. If you only have one faculty uh, for every 300 students, you're going to get obviously a bit lower than the full 10%. And now uh, the remaining 40% is research activity. And this is where you have to be, again, really critical about this because of that 40%, 25% is going to be in terms of total NIH, total federal research activity funding. And 15% is actually the, um, and I didn't write this here, but it's research um, per faculty member. Okay. So what that means is the 15% the is the amount of funding standardized by the amount of faculty you have. And then 25% is just the overall amount of funding. Uh, and you'll know that the way that this is described is by direct and indirect costs. When you get funding for research, most of that funding is like, hey, here are the direct costs of my research and here's what you need to fund. But the research may also have indirect costs, whether that's we might lose a bunch of samples and we need more money to get that. And so all of that funding, both the direct and indirect costs are taken into consideration for your total research funding. Same with uh, research per faculty member. You take that total number divided by the number of faculty to standardize for the fact that obviously if an institution has 50,000 faculty members, they're going to have way more funding than an institution with five faculty members. But then if you divide it by the total number of faculty members, that allows for a more comparable uh, comparison. So all that to say, um, different schools are obviously going to have very different things, but I, I just want to put this into perspective because, for example, thing, places like Harvard do have a lot of research institutions, and that gives them a lot of funding, and that obviously is one of the contributors to why they're prestigious AF. They're obviously prestigious for many other reasons, and uh, you know I never got in, so I can't say that um, – uh, I, I can't even say I'm Harvard material, but all that to say, this is just one of the reasons why Harvard is as incredible as it is, because it has so many research institutions, such as MGH, Brigham, Beth Israel, and all of them kind of come together to, to contribute to that research funding. And now let's add it all up. So remember, the peer assessment is 15%, the residency program director is 15%, the median MCAT is 13%, median GPA is 6%, acceptance rate is 1%. Faculty resources is 10%, and then fifth, total NIH or total federal research activity is 25%, and a federal research activity per faculty member is 15%. And that's ultimately how, when you put all of these together and add them up, the, the schools with the highest percent out of 90 uh, out of 100 will be at the top, and that's how you get the top five, and then then you just arrange chronologically by score. So hopefully this was uh, helpful to you. If it was, please drop a like, comment, share, subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. Peace.